I don't know if everybody knows what this stream is going to be about. If you've seen the previous episodes, this is about compiling compilers. And this time, uh, we will actually compile compilers live because I have a backup machine that's doing all of the compiling. So I can be a lot more uh, natural about how I program rather than having everything planned out in advance. You can see me make all of the fun mistakes. Yes, so uh, that's right. We're compiling uh, SpiderMonkey and we're looking at how uh, SpiderMonkey does things. Um, each, each stream is usually uh, one specific bug that we're looking at, or it might be uh, we're looking at a bug in pieces, which is what the first, I don't know, five or six streams were about, where we looked at, um, we broke down a bug into smaller pieces and then we worked through all of that. So, all right. Ooh, yes, we're starting to get some viewers. Awesome. I'm so excited you're all here. Um, okay, so uh, following from our last stream, I, uh, I thought it was actually kind of nice to not plan everything heavily in advance and have the whole bug finished before I came on online. So that's going to be the same case here. I've got it partially figured out. I know I know where my feet are, but I haven't finished it. So we're going to finish it together. And let's talk a little bit about what it is and also why I'm not doing top level await yet. Uh, I mentioned maybe the last two streams that I'm thinking about doing top level await, which is it's been the big project that I've been working on for the last couple of months at work. And um, it's a really interesting uh, thing. So I would love to share it with everybody. Um, but it's not quite ready. And I want to make sure that uh, I have a nice story to tell. So it's not too confusing. And I don't tell you the wrong thing. So it's going to take a little bit longer for me to get the materials ready for that. In which case, we're going to look at something that happened at the last TC39 meeting. So TC39 is where JavaScript gets specified. Um, it's where we decide whether we want to introduce a new feature, which bugs need to be solved, and stuff like that. Okay, so with that kind of groundwork in, in the world... Hello, Ian. I just realized that my camera is like, again, kind of like, not entirely focused. I don't know how to use this thing. I need to get the software for it. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so what was I saying? Uh, TC39, it's a place full of people where we make decisions about JavaScript as a programming language, including fixing bugs in the specification and including introducing new features. What we're looking at here, this uh, GitHub page that I'm showing you, uh, titled normative set function uh, name and length in create built-in function. This is a change in the specification which has uh, interesting consequences for us as an engine. We're going to look at it um, and talk about what needs to be changed and how this impacts. And we're going to read this back together. So that'll be fun. Any questions? Anybody want to know anything before we dive into this? Sorry if the chat box is jumping around. Is this in Rust? No, <laughs> it's not in Rust. Uh, we're going to be doing this in C++. Um, I, do, I never know if people are joking, if it's not like a meme, if everything's in Rust. Uh, we're doing this in C++. We have another part of the project that is in Rust, um, but we're not doing that today. So today you're going to learn the joys and, uh, and sorrows of writing C++ on a day-to-day -day basis. And now you probably know it already. <laughs> but Okay. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, let's try to understand what this PR is telling us that we need to change. And then we are going to jump into what we're going to do. So Julian uh, Weiss or Weiss uh, or Wells, Wells, that's an L, that's not an I, um, asks, what about top level await? So anybody who's just joining right now, I explained why I'm not doing top level await yet. Sorry, um, I'm still working on it. Uh, so it just went for review yesterday and uh, I want to get the reviews in because I will be making lots of material to explain what's going on in top level await to help us walk through the code 
uh, and uh, make it clear what kind of changes we're making, how async await, uh, how suspension works in the engine, which is pretty cool. But also, like just going through the code, it might be a bit difficult to see exactly what's going on. So I'm I'm planning on making some materials to help us walk through the code. And once that's done, hopefully by next week, <laughs> still have some more work to do. So, <laughs> and not by next week, by the next stream. Um, that's that might be a little bit too uh, optimistic. We'll find out. Hopefully by then we'll start working on top level await and doing our own implementation and walking through all of the pieces that will make that um, possible. I do expect that one to be bigger than the bug we're working on right now. So I'm expecting that this bug is going to take us one hour to do and uh, top level await will probably be, probably be several streams to get through. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's learn about this bug. So I'll just read it out. Um, this PR is normative. Normative means it has an impact on the behavior. Like uh, it has an impact on what engines will do rather than something that's just descriptive uh, or just prose that doesn't necessarily dictate what the engines are gonna do. Uh, this PR is normative as it defines the order in which length and name properties are added to built-in functions. So uh, built-in function is anything that is like a function that's built into the engine. Like a function is a built-in function, for example. Um, I've added name as a parameter since abstract closures don't have names, which would make, the, uh, make using them to create non-anonymous functions impossible. Uh, I've added name as a parameter. So uh, we're going to be looking at the uh, create built-in function and seeing a new parameter there. I'm noticing that my screen is blinking. Is it, that happening for anybody else? Oh no. <laughs> um, maybe. <laughs> so there's a new parameter. Yeah, it's blinking, isn't it? Okay, I'll fix that. I've been gradually improving my streaming setup, but there are still some, some dark parts <laughs> of it. Uh, okay, so new parameter. Since abstract closures don't have names, which would make using them to create non-anonymous functions impossible. Uh, it also pres preserves compatibility for WebIDL, which uses inline definitions for stuff. We're not going to look into like WebIDL, and basically we're going to ignore that second half. But uh, we are just going to look at defines the order in which length and name properties are added to built-in functions. That's what we care about. Let's take a look at what changed in the specification. So the most important bit here, and um, we're, oops, we're going to have to scroll a little bit to see it, is going to be not this, but probably this. Where is it? Um, that's await. That's create list iterator record. So uh, as we read this, we can see that before we had a variable called onFulfilled, that uh, was this create built the, re the return value of this create built-in function. This bang means that this will not fail. So there's no chance that we need to exit with an abrupt completion. Uh, and, and, that's been uh, and that's not really been replaced. That still exists here on fulfilled. Uh, and the addition, so before we just had steps fulfilled, now we've got length fulfilled and a string. Um, as parameters being passed into create built-in function. So we've got two extra uh, parameters that are going into this create built-in function, which we'll see in a second. Um, and here we do the same thing. And here, what's the change? No change, no change, no change. This is all the same except for this bit. Here it's again, we're just saying that this has two new uh, two new parameters, anything else that it does. It looks like it does something more. Uh, do I have to read this all? Oh no. <laughs> okay, so we're the same up to here, where steps is the definition of the function provided by the specification and the initial property length. 
yada yada. Okay, so what's been added here is name is the initial value of the function's name property and length is the initial value of the function's uh, length property. And then the rest, so then we've got a description of what slots is. I don't believe slots has been changed. Prototype likely hasn't been changed, etc. Okay, so that was a long sentence. Ah, that's annoying. Okay, so okay, so here's the here's the change to the definition of create built-in function. You can really think of these um, parts of the specification kind of like function definitions. Let's even take a look at that. Increment two six two. This is my favorite part of the specification and require object course a little bit. But what we're looking at now is create built-in. And I can just go to the definition here. So we've got this definition and um, we can even get the nice rendered version. So this is the old original one. And this is a snapshot of the new one where we've got length and name, as you see. That's missing in our original one. In the new one, we've got length and name. The abstract operation create built-in function takes arguments, steps, lengths, name, and internal slot list. We're pretty much gonna ignore everything that doesn't have to do with length and name, and we're just gonna keep really focused on, on those two. Uh, uh, internal slots list is a list of names of internal slots. Fantastic. And optional arguments, realm and prototype, we might cover realm in, an, in another point, but just to give you a really quick idea of what a realm is, it's your global, uh, like your global object. Just imagine it to be that, and that's close enough for it to be right. It's not exactly that. It's a little, there's a little more to it, but that's close enough. Uh, internal slot list um, must be defined as part of the object. This operation creates a built-in function object and performs the following steps when called. And from the, uh, from the diff that we saw earlier over here, we can see that the two things that change is we add two lines to this function definition, which is uh, we want to perform set function length and set function name. So this is we're creating a built in function and the two steps that we're adding to it is we're explicitly setting the length and the name. Um, yeah, and that's what we see here. Yeah. No, there we go. That's what we see there. Uh, what else is interesting here? People are seeing the blink of the... I don't know why that's happening. That's, that's really funny. I think it's just my chat window is blinking. Super strange. Um, anything else changed? That's pretty much it. Hello? And anarchy, I guess the four is an A, or an forky. <laughs> it's an forky from now on, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so what else happens? Uh, essentially, the, the high level uh, description that I gave you of what was going on in these previous lines, where we're explicitly saying what the length is and like figuring out what the, what the length is for this function. Um, and uh, then we're calling create built-in function as we did before, uh, usually with an empty string as a empty uh, as a, as an empty string. Did I just say empty string is an empty string? Name is an empty string. Someone asks, Julian asks, what does length mean here? And we've got a nice description here. Length uh, in in this specific case is the number of non-optional parameters of the function definition in, and then we have await fulfilled, which we'll be looking at later. Uh, so that's the number that we expect there. Um, let's see if we have a description here of what length is. Length, 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 anything? No. Let's take a look here. Um, no description of what length is. Length is basically the number of, uh, was it parameters that they said? Non-optional parameters. That's, that's what it's defined as here, and it's also defined the same way here, and I think it might be defined consistently as that everywhere. So yeah, we can just say length is number of non-optional parameters. Good. Any questions, any further questions about what the spec is saying? Just 
just verifying that I didn't miss any details. I think that's pretty much it. We're defining two new parameters to create built-in function, and then we're uh, adding that to everywhere where built-in function has been defined in the specification. That's it. Here we've got steps, yeah, and we've just added length, empty string for name, Oh wait, there was a good definition of what uh, what length is. Uh, it's described here. I, I read it out and then I like lost my focus. Where was it? I read it out. I think it's here. Yes. Oh, that's not very useful. <laughs> length is the initial value of the function's length property, which is uh, the number of non-optional uh, parameters. OK, cool. Please ask any questions you might have. Uh, also, if you're joining late and you just want to orient yourself, feel free to ask uh, any kind of contextual stuff like, what are we doing? Um, where are we in the process, yada, yada, yada. Uh, anybody who's joined recently, like in the last 10 minutes, you might have missed that uh, what we are... Oh, what are we doing? Uh, we are hacking on SpiderMonkey. SpiderMonkey is the compiler uh, that uh, runs JavaScript within the Firefox browser. It's also used in a couple of other places, I think, although I'm not 100% sure. I think MongoDB is using it. I think also uh, the GNOME uh, project is using it, I think. It's it's got a, it's embedded in a couple of places, um, and then its primary use from our perspective is Firefox. Uh, so yeah, use Firefox, download Firefox. It's great, and then maybe you can hack on it. It'll be awesome. <laughs> uh, okay, cool. Um, so, and where are we in the process? We are just reviewing the work that we're going to do because I said I wanted to do top level weight, but we're not doing that yet. Also, enable warp. We've got a brand new fantastic um, uh, top tier JIT compiler, and you can check it out if you enable warp. And uh, if you want to know how to do that, I've got a couple of colleagues who might be able to drop in the instructions for how to enable it. And if not, then I will enable it myself um, and show you how to do that after we finish this bug. Right. So, um, so now we're taking this small bug and we're going to look at how, uh, at how um, objects are being created, uh, well, how built-in functions are being, being created. We're going to learn a little bit about what SpiderMonkey does in order to optimize that, to make it fast. And yeah, that's it. There's a question that says it is, and I have no idea. Oh, it's, it's enabled by default in Nightly. Yes, that is true. It's enabled by default in Nightly, but some people might not know how to do that. So I might just go through the steps myself to show that. And thank you, Mike, for uh, posting uh, more or less the right instructions. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so let's get started. Let's take a look at some code. Uh, do we want to do this in the? Uh, let's let's take a look at some code from the perspective, like just so that let's uh, let's take a wander through the code and understand what's going on there. Okay. So we can go to search box, which is our wonderful way of searching through the code base. And what we can go to is we can go and take a look at how functions are defined. Because we're working with built-in functions, we can look at JS function and get a sense of um, how we do that thing. <laughs> nice. Outcross also has it enabled by default. Are you using maybe Nightly? Uh, because in that case, you might get it by default. Oh. Uh, yes, then, it, then it's the nightly thing. I know how to do this. Let's actually run it and see what the problem is. Because when this was presented at committee, um, it looked like Firefox was working. We looked like we have, uh, we looked like we had uh, everything right according to that bug. And let's take a look at why it looks right. And then let's take a look at why it looks wrong. So uh, I'm going to do a really simple um, test case for us to play around with, and then we can mess with it. So I have a I have a fresh build here. This is on my new remote machine. And yeah. Okay. And I also set it up to actually use mock, but I haven't cleaned it up yet. So I've got this <laughs> error that's saying that I don't have re review board installed, whatever. Okay, cool. So 
Uh, we've got a little JavaScript shell here, and let's uh, let's write a little bit of code. So, um, how can we detect which uh, what order the properties are in? So we can do this. Uh, get own. So if you're if you're like looking from the perspective of a JavaScript developer, this is something that's going to be available to you, and you can just like write this. And we're going to use function as our built-in function. And here we have it. We've got first prototype, which the specification at the moment doesn't say anything about. Then we've got length. Stop that. Length. And then we've got name. Fantastic. Well, let's take a look at the spec. I mean, that sounds pretty good. That sounds like exactly what we want to do. You know, they say length and then name. What's the problem? OK. Um, just to highlight those two lines. There we go. Back to programming. Now to be sad and realize that not all is well. Um, so I'm going to have to restart the shell. Or I would have had to use another function. I'm just going to restart the shell. OK, um, let's say we do function dot name first. OK, cool. The name of the function, built-in function, is function. That's, that's pretty good. And now I'm going to do object dot get own property so, uh, function. All right, so here's the problem. Here we've got length and then name. And here we've got name, then length. Any thoughts about this? Anybody got any ideas about what we're dealing with? And if you already know how a lot of uh, engines do uh, optimization of properties, you must not speak until other people have a chance to think about it. And then you can talk. Any ideas? What's going wrong? Ooh, I'm blurry. I really need to fix the camera also. Look at my hand camera and then don't ah, i'm gonna be blurry for this video that's okay correct the list is lazily initialized that is the right guess and that is exactly what's going on um strings at the end as they are variable oh i don't quite understand that comment strings at the end as they are variable far length Strings at the end because they are variable length name. Lazily initialized is the right answer here. Ah, I'm so blurry. OK, at some point I'm going to learn how to use this camera. Maybe I should do that now. I don't know. Hmm. That sucks. OK, um, yes, the right answer is lazy, lazy initialization. And it's a Logitech camera. Mike, how do I fix this? <laughs> There's another good question. Why would laziness change it? OK, Mike is going to help me fix my camera. And while he's doing that, I'm going to show you what the problem is. Let's do it. Back to the spec. Well, not the spec. Uh, back to this. OK, cool. Um, so the first question might be, why uh, do these change order? Um, so this has to do, turn the camera lens right and sharpen the focus. Yes, this is what I look like when I take my glasses off and look in the mirror. <laughs> um, okay, Mike is going to come back. He knows how that camera works and then we'll figure it out because I don't have a lens on this. There's nothing physical I can turn. It just automatically, it automatically blurs me. But I have fabulous skin this way. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm looking at one function that's going to be important for us. Disable autofocus. Let's see if I've, I think I actually have that Logitech software. I don't. OK. Well, I'm in focus now. Fantastic. I think it's because I kicked the plant. Maybe I should move the plant out of the way. <laughs> OK. Uh, back to the task at hand. Um, OK, so we've got. Um, OK, how, how is this being built? Uh, I'm just going to quickly show you. Uh, sort of a thing that helps us describe what uh, built-ins should look like in the language. So we've got these things called class ops. And in it, it's got a few things that will be called by some consuming code. Um, there's Node.js and Mozilla Central. 
Do you mean there's no JavaScript in Mozilla Central, or do you mean there's no JS folder in your Mozilla, JS executable? You have to build it, uh, but you can also, actually I can show you where that is. Sorry, I'm, I'm like jumping all over the place. Oh no, I exited Tmux. No. Um, Yeah, Steve, it's probably from a year ago. This laptop's pretty old, so I, th I didn't start a new Mozilla Central instance. Um, I, I started a, um, I started a, uh, from my previous one, so that's probably, that's probably why I've got VZZ things. Okay, so if you're like, oh, I can't find the JS executable, just go into the object directory. And, um, Dist slash is wait, didn't I know how to do this before? Am I doing it in the wrong screen? I'm so sorry. Firefox and focus. I have so much focus today, as you can tell. Okay, so um one second. How did I used to do this? I've suddenly, I've suddenly totally blanked on how everything works. Um. Let's do that and then see the object. I think this is it. And So this is the executable. So um, uh, Aukras asked, where is the executable? You can find it here if you go into, so my Mozilla Central is called Firefox. And if you've built it, then you'll have it in an object front end. But uh, yeah, and also um, my moz config is available on my GitHub. So if you want, uh, you can take my moz config and use it. The important bits, the really important bits are uh, enable J application JS. So you can use um, you can use uh, m you can use moz build and moz run to run your to run your uh, JS binary. And I'll I'll dump that in the in the chat in a second. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, focus, focus. What was I doing? I was explaining how um, how this works. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you a, just a high overview of the two things that we're interested in. The first one, well, the first one is actually resolve, function resolve. What function resolve does is it resolves properties for us. And then the other one is enumerate, which enumerates properties. So when we call, uh, when we call, um, 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 when we call get own properties, uh, get own property names, what we're doing is we're going to enumerate over the property names. So that does something extra than what would happen if we didn't do that. So that's calling something extra. And then function resolve. So this is going to sort of uh, clarify why we're seeing the behavior that we're seeing. Okay, so let's take a look at function resolve. So here's function resolve. It's pretty long. Okay, so what is this doing? Um, we're checking if the JS ID is an atom. So uh, an atom is a representation of given names uh, used by the program. If it's not, then we just return true. Rooted function. Uh, so um, we have this thing called a rooting API in the um, in the engine. It has to do with GC. I'm not going to go into depth into depth with it now. Um, JS is Adam. Okay, so now we're checking things. We're checking, is it the prototype? And so uh, what we're doing is we're checking, is the ID a prototype right here? So we have, uh, on the context, we have a series of names that we reuse. We don't allocate it each time whenever we want to check if the name is prototype or something else. We've got that sort of stored away and we can access it through dot prototype on the names. Um, collection of things. Uh, and uh, what we're doing is we're checking for the prototype here. 
we're doing some work with it, which we're going to ignore because we're not interested in that specific property for now. Then we're doing the exact same thing. We're checking is the ID, the ID has been passed in by a handle. So handle and rooted, they're kind of two sides of the same coin, something we won't get into. But if you want to read about it, you can search for um, SM doc and rooting. So if you want to learn about the rooting API, you can go here. Everything's done. If you want to learn anything about anything in SpiderMonkey, try searching first for smdoc and um, some part of the term you're looking for, and you'll get some pretty good documentation about how that works. OK. Where did I, what did I just do? Oh, no. Uh, there we go. SMDoc is fantastic. It was a really great effort done by the SpiderMonkey team. OK, here we are back in Function Resolve. And we're starting from this line, which is uh, we're checking if the ID that's been passed into the uh, Function Resolve um, function is indeed length. So we're checking, is it does it match? And if it is length, or it's this other thing called name, the other property we're interested in, uh, we do a check is internal function object. I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> um, and then we do some work. And here is a nice comment telling us a little bit of detail about what this work entails. So since function length and function name are configurable, they could be resolved and then deleted. So we've got uh, a little code snippet that describes how that might happen. Afterwards, asking for f length or f name again will cause this resolve hook to be run again. Defining the property again the second time, though, would be, uh, I believe that they meant, though, would be a bug. Assert, uh, and then we've got another little code snippet. We use the resolved length and resolve name flags as a hack to prevent this bug. So we have this function, which is checking something. So I'm going to click it and take a look at what it does. What it does is it checks has resolved length. I dig a little bit deeper into it. And here we've got the flag resolved, um, uh, resolved length. And uh, same thing happens for resolved name. Cool. And then here we've got this V, which is up here. OK, I'm going to say one really quick thing about rooted values. Um, when you're going to be defining something like, and it's it's the main place where you want to hold it, then you want to define it above where it gets uh, sort of. <laughs> this is the function that should own this value, not this get unresolved length function. Basically, that. I don't know if that's a good description. Um, <laughs> Steve, if you've got a better description, or Ian, if you've got a better description that's like one line, <laughs> please drop it in the chat. Because <laughs> my understanding of it is um, function resolve owns v not uh, get unresolved length owns v. That's how I understand it. OK. So uh, we're getting that uh, unresolved length and we're storing it into v. Then we uh, then if it's not a length, we do this else thing where we say if function has the resolved name, return true. So we early exit out of this function. Then do the same thing essentially uh, as length, but for our name and store it into V. And then we do this native defined data property with a few parameters. Then after all of this work, if it's length, we set resolved length. We just took a look at that function and saw how that worked. Otherwise, um, resolve the name. So we're setting the flag that was described here. That's the hack and that's the whole implementation. So. What we need to do is uh, change this function a little bit. And um, I don't know, did I already go over the function enumerate? And is it clear why we actually end up with length in the end? Because that's a bit interesting too, because what this is telling us is only if we see a length property already, should we define it when we're, um, should we define it? But when we're enumerating over it, it exists. 
So Ian says, root handle, deal with garbage collected values. If you want to return a garbage collected value from a function, you create a rooted thing to hold it, then pass a mutable handle to rooted thing. Yes, that's a detail that I dropped from my description. This is about garbage collection. Uh, I don't fully understand how the garbage collection side of it works, but I sort of thought of it in terms of uh, owning. Cool. Um, right. Okay. So uh, why does it happen? Okay, let's just take a look at that weird bit of code again. Uh, let's take a look at that weird bit of code again. Why does it happen that when we run object dot get property Why does, why does this work? Why are we actually getting length and name when we just saw that we need to access those in order to get those put onto the, um, onto the object in whatever sense? We haven't taken a look at that yet. Um, and that has to do with fun and new. So that has to do with function enumerate, which goes through each of these three uh, property names. Um, and it says uh, has own property name and basically it runs through each one. So the first one that we go through is prototype, then we get length, then we get name. So we instantiate those in function enumerate if they don't exist already. And then if we look at fun resolve, in function resolve, uh, we do a check if they exist already and return true for those. And if they don't exist already, we actually instantiate them. And that's why the order changes, but we have the same properties on that object. And I didn't show you anything. Sorry. <laughs> uh, fun enumerate. So to show that again, here's the bit of code that's going through each of the properties. So we've got prototype, length, name, and we're walking through those and basically instantiating each of them before we uh, before we uh, move on, um, and that corresponds to function resolve, where if the thing has already been resolved, so that's the case where we resolve name first, and then we run get own own uh, property names. Uh, we get we know that name already exists, so we return true for it, and uh, for length we define it. Okay, cool. And then we've got a discussion about computer architectures. Awesome. OK. So hopefully that clarifies like the picture of the bug that we're working on. Um, also, I want to show a little thing that might be interesting. Object, um, to do object.getOwnProperty names, we're having this side effect of enumerating over the properties. You can also do, I think it's dump object. And then say math, dump, I forget, small d. Ooh, that's a lot of stuff. Let's pick a smaller one. Uh, let's, let's, let's define our own function. Let's say uh, function f and then dump object f. And here, uh, uh, what we see here is a dump of the information that's currently held in that object, and it has no properties. But if we do uh, properties f, uh, get own property names. I always get them mixed up. We see that it now has them, which means that when we do this again, you see how the properties are uh, have changed. So before we had no properties, and now suddenly we have them. Now I'm going to point out one thing. Uh, in the change to the specification for create um, for create built-in function, it's saying that the point at which name and length should be created is with the creation of the object. We don't actually want to do that because that means that. Um, we need to instantiate properties that may never be used by the programmers who are working with it. And that means like allocating memory and like doing stuff that we don't want to do. Uh, it might be a waste of time. And that means like slower startup or slower running programs. Not great. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about how programming, how 
uh, JavaScript engines and other dynamically uh, dynamic programming languages are optimized because that's part of the reason why we can't do something like just do a sort or, um, well, um, how do I put it? The reason why we don't want to do exactly what the spec is doing. Okay, so um, yeah, let's uh, let's take a look at some drawings. Okay, so uh, actually, before we start talking about shapes, which are really cool, I don't know if you folks have seen them already, but they're really neat. Um, we're gonna talk a bit about uh, about properties. So let's say it's going to be hot pink. It's going to be hot pink because Steve is in the chat. Let's say you've got an object and it has a property A, for example. And this property, you know, it can, it can be anything. We don't really care about what's in this, pro uh, this property. It's just existing. And, um, Hmm. How can we do this? <laughs> yeah, let's let's say it's property A, and we do object whatever. It's a good example of this. Okay, this is a good simple example. Then we do uh, hmm, not that object dot B equals. And then we've got some other value. It doesn't matter what these values are. So how do engines like SpiderMonkey actually do this? Well, we would have to know everything about this ahead of time. Um, if we wanted to like, if, it, if we wanted to have like a complete picture of what that object is, but sometimes developers are always adding new properties to that object. Um, and additionally, you might have something like a function that uh, creates some uh, some object that should be an equal sign and then it returns it mm -hmm. i'm doing the worst job of this you know what? i'm going to do this in code let's do this in code this is going to be easier to read if it's in code <laughs> okay uh let's not do that um, I have lost my terminal. There it is. Okay, let's say we've got a uh, function who and it returns a uh, just some not very important properties. And then we can do object is equal to who and const object two is equal to who so we basically created two objects um, that have sort of the same shape as one another but for example i might say object uh, the first object gets a b is equal to five and object two gets a c equal to seven whatever doesn't matter what they're and in this case object the first object now has a slightly different shape but the first two properties are the same so uh, test and thing are the same as object two uh, but c and b are different so um it would really suck if we had to start uh, if what we had to do on the engine was effectively let me make that bigger. Um, what would really suck for the engine is if we went in and we're like, um, uh, let's say for that object and object two, I can't spell. Um, so the first object we might say has this property. Oops, I don't want that. Let's make it look neater. And this is going to be test. 
And then the next property that it has is going to be uh, what was what did I name the other one? Thing. Thing. There's thing. Um, and then the difference is well, before we get into the difference, we've essentially got a duplication, right? We've got another object test and then da, 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 thing so we've got a we've got duplication here this is object two and then object one and the difference being that this has a nice looking b and this has a nice looking c that's the difference. So in this case, uh, this is an empty string. This is an empty string, empty string, empty string. And this is some number. You know, they, they contain things. Wouldn't it be great if rather than uh, creating like both the dictionary, which contains the name and also having the value, what we could do is we could instead separate those ideas into different concepts. So instead of doing it this way, what we do, get rid of all of this, and my ugly drawings, um, is we separate this into pieces. So we've got a um, thing, test. First one was test, then the second one is Thing. And then here we've got like, uh, let's change the color, it's going to be green. We've got an empty string, empty string, um, eraser. Ooh, now it should be smaller. Okay. And yet another color. So, sorry for the terrible drawing. I'm trying to be a bit faster. There's object two. This is object one. Yeah, whatever. Sorry about all of the blinking. I'm not sure why it's blinking. Wouldn't it be great if the property names were held sort of separately from the values. So that's the first part of the optimization. That means we're not allocating like the property name twice, or, you know, for some objects, you might have it allocated like a hundred times because you've got a hundred such objects. Um, so we're only allocating the name once, and then we're allocating the value of that property name, uh, of that, yeah, of that property name somewhere else rather than having them in the same place. So we've got this thing here and we're sharing that. And the shape that it takes, the shape of shapes, is that they are sort of lists, uh, well, shapes exist within lists uh, and are sort of, um, uh, it's a linked list, basically it's a linked list. Uh, so this is a shape. And we'll take a look at the documentation in a second. Both of these are shapes. And the thing is, what's really great is that these linked lists uh, can take the form of a list, but they can also take the form of a tree. So when we're diverging, for example, uh, suddenly we've got this number six and we've got some other number, uh, which is, I forget what I put, let's say it's five. What we can do is we can say that we've got this property here, which is B, and we've got property C and it looks like this. So we've effectively got a tree of uh, shapes and when objects diverge and have different properties we can reuse the base structure that exists um, higher up in the chain. Does that make sense? <laughs> I feel like I should have practiced that better. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I think shapes are super cool. It's a really neat optimization, but it's also uh, the reason why we can't just like, for example, nilly willy change things around and insert things because that would mean basically moving things around and probably doing way more work than we need to. 
Um, so if you want to read more, there, uh, is there only one tree for objects? As far as I know, no. Um, so if you've got like an object with a totally different set of properties, like you don't have test and thing, like you've got like foo and bar. Um, and uh, yes, <laughs> Shipes was, so I think that might've even happened partially. I think we're working on it. Um, uh, so is there only one tree for objects? As far as I know, no, but this is also not my special specialization within the engine. So I might get it wrong. And there are people in the chat who know it better than me. I'm just going to show you the documentation because then you know where to look. Uh, so yeah, so uh, the mixture between shapes and types, um, uh, we have two distinct data structures for collecting sort of similar no, we've got uh, we've got the types we want to know what type things are and we want to know what the shape of the object uh what what the general layout of the object is ah okay so ian has information about what happened on shipes it got mor morphed into shoopies or shuples and then we decided to get rid of types so <laughs> that's what happened <laughs> And in here we want shape. Okay. If you want to read about shapes, here's the documentation. You can find it through smdoc shapes. And uh, what I just described to you is pretty much, well, it kind of is described here. It's, it goes into a lot more detail, but you now have sort of a visualization of what shapes are doing and you can read this. That's exciting. Um, eh. Now what? Ah, yes. Okay. So the reason why those properties are in the wrong order is because uh, when we're instantiating it, then we are basically saying first we've got a name and then we've got a length and we need to make sure that we first say we've got a length and then we've got a name. <laughs> okay, cool. Let's do that because we're, we're running out of time. <laughs> I've spent so much time talking about <laughs> tangential stuff. Okay, we're going to do this super fast. It's not going to be a complete implementation, but it's going to be a lot of fun, I hope. Um, and we are here. So we can jump into JS function and we can go to fun resolve. Ta da! Uh, I hope everyone can see what I'm doing. Yes, I think you can. We just looked at this inside of um, search box. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to mess with this stuff. In particular, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to be reusing the um, name and length thing. So I'm just going to add myself a little variable here is name. And then let's get rid of this. OK, so um, we've got this conditional here and uh, we kind of aren't going to need it anymore. Sort of is the thing, I think. <laughs> Whether it's true or not remains to be seen. Um, right. Okay. Is length. Mm, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Okay. Let me think out loud because otherwise you don't know what's going on in my head. What I'm thinking of is um, basically, if we've got a length but no name, it's not a problem because the enumeration will take care of it for us. But if we have a name and not a length, that's a problem because we should uh, make sure that we first have the length put onto the uh, chain of shapes, uh, onto the list of shapes, and then we add the name. So to do that, I'm just going to do something really, really awful, um, which is, so we've got this else here. Oh, how to do this cleanly. So in the pseudocode, that does not work. I'm going to throw the length stuff in with the name stuff, which is a terrible idea. I'm assuming that, okay, so we've got this code that says has a resolved name. If we've already resolved a name, we don't need to do any of this work. Fantastic. Um, if we have a resolved length, we don't want to return true. In fact, we probably want to invert this uh, check. And then only do this funny thing with get unresolved length in that case. Now the actual definition of the of the shape and of the property itself happens in this native defined data property function. And I'm just going to do something really ugly and grab that. 
This is, this is like the ugliest code. Don't do what I do. Um, and instead of using the ID, we don't want the ID here. We want something else. We want this CX names length bit. Um, so here we're storing the unresolved length into V and then we are um, using it inside of this native defined function and then we're redefining it here which probably we shouldn't do but i'm gonna leave it like that anyway uh, just for <laughs> simplicity uh, and then i'm also gonna throw in this set resolve length i don't know if this is gonna work let's let's see if this works Let's see how fast it is. This time. Come on. Oh no, I have the wrong thing happening. Okay, let's fix it. No, don't try this at home. It's such a bad idea. There we go. I added a J here for some reason. Oh, you forgot what the problem is. The problem is that um, the spec will now enforce the order of length and name. Uh, length must come first, followed by name. And the spec also says that this should be instantiated when the built-in function is instantiated. We're ignoring the instantiation requirement, um, in part because there's going to be a problem later down the line that we're going to have to solve with prototype, uh, but also just to not uh, not instantiate properties that are not used basically make them lazy so what we're doing now is we're enforcing just the ordering rather than creating them um, with the built-in function itself is that clear i hope that's clear so i'm going to do uh, our error case that we had before which was function dot name first and then we go object dot get and then of course um, if we do dump object we get just uh, the one property oh yes perfect uh, it defined everything so we requested um, just name and we got everything back I wasn't expecting that to happen neat uh, so we can go well then I guess this isn't quite so exciting and then function Cool, and it's in the right order. So uh, my little hack actually does work. Um, if I do function, well, ah, this is the other thing. So there's another problem that we're potentially gonna have to deal with. If we do function f, this is just a dummy function. Uh, so we can just say f, and we do f.x equals 10. Then we do, uh, Let's see what dump object gives us. F. Here we've only got x right now when we just dump the object without running the enumeration. Um, and then if we do f, now we've got prototype length and name after the x. So the reason why this might be an issue, or it will be an issue, um, is that uh, this tells us that x was in, uh, x was initialized before property length and name, where length and name should have been initialized before x was. Does that does that make sense to everybody? Like the the issue that we're going to have uh, to solve at some point. Probably not today because we're at the hour, and I promised people that I would stop doing it for two hours. <laughs> so I'll give a little. Uh, class is a plain object array function, etc. Ah, you're asking the class, I guess. <laughs> so just just to like really quickly uh, jump into what we might need to do to actually properly solve this is uh, basically when we're initializing this x value. So for example, if we do function, uh, hmm. ah. Defining what class is in my previous comment. Oh, okay. Ah, I see, you did say class compartment or prototype. <laughs> Sorry. 
Uh, okay, so function uh, m, let's say we've got this function m, and then we do m dot for each. For example, we're just accessing a property. Does this cause uh, anything interesting to happen? We can do dump object to find out without any kind of side effects. Check m, and the properties list is empty. So just ac accessing a property doesn't initialize it, but if we initialize it the way that we did here, we need to do something. So that's an assignment. Um, and if we're doing assignments, maybe I can even use ACK because I'm not searching um, on my streaming machine. Uh, let's say, uh, is it property assign? Let's see if that works. And if it doesn't, I find it in tests, but I don't find it where I'm actually interested. Let me see if... I think it's in opcodes. That word? Non-strict assignment of a property. So for example, this opcode is set prop that's what it's called how do we do that set prop oh that was wrong uh julian asks if an object a b and object bc would share a tree. They wouldn't. They would be two separate trees. Oh, they would be rooted in the same empty shape, but uh, beyond that, they wouldn't be sharing a tree. So actually, uh, Ian, then that means that all uh, shapes come from a single tree. Yeah, that actually makes sense. They just have different um, uh, one like non-empty nodes. Okay, set props. I used to know how this worked. I spent a ton of time on this. I spent like an entire six months doing this. Let me search this on, on Searchbox. Mm -hmm. Oh, if you had new array, it would be a different shape tree. Fantastic, I'm glad Ian is here. <laughs> I learn stuff when Ian is around. And we want to search inside of the engine. Okay, set property. I guess we ultimately end up using uh, using set property. Da, da, da. Is it inside of the interpreter? I would have expected it to be in the interpreter. Oh, I know why I didn't find it. There we go. Case set prop. That's what I was interested in. Set prop and strict set prop. Set property enumeration. Set property. Native set property. That's again on the native object. So this is getting into spec text. And I guess what we're interested in is set non-existent property because that's where things would be interesting for us. Um. and define non-existing property. It's, we're just digging really deep down into this. Um, oh, I think that, uh, yeah, okay, so we have define data property, then we dig into uh, define non-existing property. Because I've seen this code before. Okay, so somewhere in this code, we're going to have to make an intervention and make sure that if we are uh, defining, uh, if we're defining the first 
property on an object that we make sure that the required property's name and length are set correctly. So that's the task. We have a nice hack that fulfills sort of a baseline of what we wanted to do. And then maybe next time we can like dig through this code and implement it fully if I don't have everything ready for a top level await again. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so uh, that's, I think, all we're going to do today because uh, I don't want to overwhelm people and it can be a lot of information. Uh, I'm going to stop here and we will pick up in two weeks either this or we will pick up top level await. I'll be available in the chat. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, uh, thank you also to my colleagues and to uh, colleagues on Spider Monkey for clarifying all the stuff that I sometimes don't quite get. And also for some colleagues joined us from TC39. Thank you so much. It's always cool to have another engine's perspective on the work that we do. So, all right. Ciao.